Uh, John, it's great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm oh. looking forward. <laughs> yeah, all the way. What time is it there? It's like seven something? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock in Belgium. So yes, six hours ahead. Gotcha. Well, side question. How long have you been in Belgium, been located there? This would be nine years. So 20, yes, almost 10 years. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Quite a long time now. Yeah, yeah, that is quite quite a time. It must have a, a whole bunch of different rules to do here. But it's yeah. also got to be a paradise. So I'm glad you are spending some time there. There are definitely good things. Yeah. So uh, I saw um, you through this blown away party mm -hmm. that I saw on Instagram and on TikTok and Facebook. And without spoiling it yet, um, how was that? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of people who kind of knew what happened and a lot of people who kind of didn't. So it was quite fun to watch it with people. And they were really excited as, uh, yeah, as they saw what was going on, as like if I won a challenge, there was a lot of cheering. And uh, <laughs> Elliot and Walker and Beth, his partner, Beth, uh, came over for the weekend. So that was really cool. And then some friends came in from Scotland as well and from a little bit all over from Germany. So it was really, really nice, really nice time. It looked like yeah, a heck of a time. Really <laughs> yeah. I would have totally been there if it wasn't an art fair in Seattle. It would have been amazing <laughs> to experience that in person. Yeah, it was a, it was the first time I was seeing it, so it was a little bit uh, a little bit strange to watch yourself on the big. We had a big big screen. I kind of sometimes still confuse meters and feet, so I had a four meter by three meter <laughs> screen, which was much bigger than anticipated. <laughs> yeah, if I would have been there, I'd have been asleep by episode six. <laughs> All right, I'll see y'all later. It's 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 a long time to stay awake and watch them. I tried. I wanted to make sure I caught them all when they came out, and I I was at the CLR fair and I watched them. When I got off the fair from like nine o'clock to eleven, and, and had to go to bed, and got up at seven a.m. and got through the rest to make sure I could be totally caught up, and it, it was a great portrayal of you and the other people on the show. And I know it's been a bit since they filmed. So when did you like start filming that? Uh, we started. Let's see. They, we filmed from like September, like the end of September. So I actually got there like uh, the day I got there on um, the day before my birthday in September. Mm -hmm. And then the filming takes place between like the, the last week of September and the second week of November. So it's quite a long time uh, if you're there the whole time. So, yeah. Like, there's a total like of 10 weeks. So what would you say you were there for? Yeah, I think it's nine weeks. So nine weeks. yeah, nine or 10 weeks. It's, it's pretty long, but it's weird. You like you get in and then you're in sequester for a few days. So you're sitting in a hotel room waiting right. to see bosses there. And then they <laughs> bring you in in like a van, you know, like almost with a bag over your head, but it wasn't like that, but it was pretty, uh, pretty strange experience in that sense. That's pretty funny. It, it feels like they shot it all in like four days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But when I watch it, I feel like that. I know how much, how much editing they did on the hours of interviews they have, and then you talk for four minutes or something throughout the whole season. It's crazy. So yeah, that's a magical uh, world of editing. So, well, we've gotten to four minutes past the hour of recording, so we'll. Uh, We'll get into it. I'll start sharing my screen first and, and sure. get through some of the formalities and then, then we'll toss it to you once I get my robot up and going here. So let me get the uh, context and I will share my screen, which is over here and we'll get rolling here. So thank you everybody for joining us. And again, my name is Aaron Shea with Habitat Detroit Fine Art. Um, I've been with the galleries for my entire life, basically, but on board as an employee since 2005, and it's been a family business. So we are America's first contemporary glass art gallery, and we're based out of Royal Oak, Michigan, right outside Detroit, and founded in 71. We say the experience of glass is life-changing, and when you walk through our doors at the gallery, it definitely is. People come for inspiration, people come to buy, people come for, to, for creativity. It's just an amazing space. So it's an amazing legacy we're able to work with every day. My partner, Corey Hampson, and I run the gallery and along with our staff. And some exciting news, one of our employees, Regina uh, G, is getting married today. So if she's watching this, which I doubt, I just want to say happy wedding and I uh, and, uh, hope, hope everything goes as planned. You never know, but uh, that's great news. So kicking over on my other screen here. We have a show up of uh, Peter Botosh from the Czech Republic. It's on Artsy. It's on our website. I want to mention it because the work is incredible. Um, and we have 360 views of all the pieces. Just something different in the glass art world that we wanted to explore from an artist somewhere in Europe. Not too close to John, but it is spectacular work. So 
Uh, many of you may or may know, not know that the GAS Conference is coming to Detroit. And those who don't know, the GAS, GAS Conference is the Glass Art Society. It's a big conference where people in the community come together and share and learn what we all love. So it's the first time it's been going to be in Detroit. And we are ecstatic here at Habitat. We're planning a bunch of events, so plan to be there uh, June 5th through 7th. Uh, if you're familiar with the Michigan Glass Project or the Functional Pipe World, they're hosting an event at the same time as well. So there's no better place to be. We're going to be launching our first in-person Not Grandma's Glass presentation, having art panels and talks, and hopefully have a fashion show. Who knows? But plan on joining us. So uh, stick around uh, to the end of the presentation. Uh, John has a very exciting announcement for his very first Habitat Limited. Uh, it's called Spilt. I spelled it wrong there because I spelled it wrong everywhere, but it's Spilt, and you'll see more of it towards the end of the presentation. So uh, John Moran has was on uh, Netflix. This is an old bumper I made as it was released on July 22nd, and if you were like me, you watched the entire thing uh, right away. If not, I highly recommend you watch it in the next 12 seconds because we're going to be discussing and spoiling it for you, everybody in a minute here. So uh, on the show, besides John, with some of other Habitat's uh, family artists like Claire Kelly and Rob Stern were on the show. So it's great to see uh, these people get in front of the public eye because Netflix has been an incredible way of exposure for what we all love uh, to those who haven't even thought about glasses and art medium. Uh, John was one of the four winners in our NGG presentation, Not Grandma's Glass, focused on artists who uh, create artwork that's not, that is not in Grandma's art collection yet. Beyond with John, there was Krista Israel, Morgan Peterson, Joseph Ivacek, and the um, exhibition and competition continues today. So we're working on the, the Not Grandma's Glass site. I just checked it. It has some problems, but we're going to get it fixed. So definitely check it out. It's a great exploration into every single artist. So I want to show a little bit of the trailer uh, for Blown Away, because why not live up to the hype and uh, show a little bit of uh, what's going on, if I can get my computer to share sound, which I think it will, but we'll give it a whirl. If not, I'll stop it. But let's just... Check out the uh, the trailer. No, no sound. Of course, my computer loves to change stuff around. Well, we're gonna skip this part because they moved the 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 sound part. So we'll skip the slide. You watch it. Watch it on Netflix. It's, I watch it on, on YouTube. It's pretty awesome to see the trailer. I don't know why they decided to change the process when I'm doing it doing a live presentation. But nonetheless, John, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's an honor to have you. Say hello to everybody. I'm going to kick out of my my slides in a second because we have some spoiler news, don't we, John? Yes, yes. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It's, it's really cool. Uh, really cool to be doing this. It's a little bit strange not seeing all your faces, but that's the, the, the internet world we live in right now. And I guess kind of the same as being on social media and Netflix. But yeah, it's uh, I'm really excited to be here. So thanks for joining, everybody. Great to have you, John. So this is your last chance, everybody. I want to just get through two slides here to let you know, because we're so excited to announce, as many of you should know, John won season three of Blown Away. There we said it. All right, news are out. That's so exciting, John. You definitely deserve it. Watching the show was incredible. You were so inspirational to those who watched, like myself, and those who participated with your great attitude and the way you kept it so real with what you worked on in the show. And I was so excited to hear that you were not only participating, but victorious. So those of you who uh, follow John, make sure you follow him on, on social media. And he has an amazing TikTok that he's been working on, just showing his process and showing his style. And if you really love him and his work, definitely follow him uh, on that system. So thank you, John, for being here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so you can take it over. And um, we can go through, you know, what you want to talk about today. I'm super excited to, you know, explore you and your work as well as your experience in the show. And I have a couple questions that uh, I want to ask you once you get your screen up and running uh, mm -hmm. that we can, you know, have a dialogue about. So we are looking at your uh, PowerPoint, go to slideshow. Yep. It did work there. You're in the middle of the presentation, though, it looks like. You're starting on uh, the presence. No, it's, it's kind of where it starts. because right, um... cool. Yeah, it was, uh, I wanted to give just a little bit of like a, a background and kind of lead into like how I ended up in, uh, in, uh, into, into Blown Away. And like there were some pieces here, yeah, like just if you don't know me as an artist, uh, what I do, yeah, what I do outside of the, the just the full hot shot. So I make a lot of uh, political work and a lot of work that's like mixed media. So this was a series I did of the President's United States where the heads are glass and the bodies are, um, made of fabric and resin 
And I think that was one of the things that I, I, they were wondering how I was going to deal with only using glass on the show. So it was kind of a fun uh, thing to be able to like switch from making a lot of mixed media work and then jump into this, uh, into this experience on Blown Away. So like one of the other things we weren't allowed to do was use any corporate imagery. So that was, I think, something that the producers were a little bit concerned about with me if I would be able to do it. <laughs> and uh, it, it worked out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was wondering, like, you could start creating on the side, the back with different materials to on the show, but they really limit you. you want to make it a straight, uh, a straight material form. So I guess like, the first kind of question that I have for you is, um, you know, why do you create art and what do you want to accomplish, you know, while you're doing it? Why, why you why you do all this? So, yeah, one of the like one of the things that I, I think came across really well on the show was that, like, most of the work that I I'm trying to make it like has an emotional connection. Um, not only to myself, but like to my experiences and I think like societal experiences. Um, so like as an artist, that's one of the things that I'm really focusing on is like, you know, critiquing um, things that are that are happening in the world, but also being aware of like how these things affect us as a society and as individuals. And I really wanted to bring that to to the show. Like when I was going, I, I knew that it was going to be hard to make overtly political work and make overtly like maybe critical work um, in the same sense as I do normally. But I wanted the same experience to be there. Like I wanted to be able to hold true to myself as, a, as an artist and try to show like what I do technically in my, um, in my material usage. Yeah, I can definitely... I made comments to people discussing like you staying true to your work and your form on the show. And it really, it really is evident because every piece you made, you seemed like you said you was a risk. Ah, oh, it's a risk. This is a risk. I'll, this is also a risk. Your finale piece was a risk, especially don't knowing you had a huge space to uh, explore and created an installation on the floor. But I think it was incredible. This is an incredible piece too. We have this here at Habitat finally, huh? Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the ones I, I wanted to like to talk about a little bit because it, it's the, the the pieces, these kind of bigger pieces, really inspired the way that I work in general when I'm making larger and smaller work. Like trying to put this depth that's like more visual in it, and that was one of the things I was happy about was I was able to kind of go into depth on the pieces and explain them in the show. That gives you the background of all the, the layers that I put into stuff, and like this piece in particular was something that I made pretty shortly after I had visited Europe the first time. And I saw these like cathedrals everywhere. And then when you would look out the door from the cathedral, there would be a McDonald's there. And it was just this kind of like strange thing where these McDonald's would pop up kind of at every tourist location and made me thinking about like how, how these things kind of spread and become a little bit like uh, insidious around. So it was really, yeah, it kind of made this piece fun to make it was it had a serious nature to it but it also has this tongue-in-cheek like vibe about it that I think is really important that it for my from my point of view as an artist that like it, it touches on a level of emotions not just one it's not just critiquing it's a it's funny it's sad it's beautiful it's grotesque and all of those things coming together yeah I kind of agree like people when they first see this work they think of gluttony but then mm -hmm. you it's really I think deep down about greed and about the idea, there's also the other seven plagues, right? The one about not something I mean, sloth, the laziness of just taking what's there because it's there. But it is a powerful piece, and people um, people come in all the time, and it's just just got set up, and it's been taking. It's over what six feet tall? Yeah, it's 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 pretty much life size. I think if Ronald were to stand up, he would be uh, almost seven feet tall. It's it's my height if I'm standing next to it, so it's crazy. And yeah. it is quite, quite, quite a wild, wild piece. Well, yeah, I just arrived. I'll take you guys later on a virtual tour through John's show. We just set up. So you'll see it in, in, in kind of in person because you don't get all the visuals. Like, what's it say on the boy's shirt in the piece? You can't really see. Does it say McDonald's or does it say something similar? Yeah, so it's McDonald's Brothers. And it's really yeah. this, uh, the, which was the original, it's the logo from the original McDonald's, like before McDonald's became this like fast food chain. And that was one of the things I was playing with was this idea of sacrifice. Like, what do we sacrifice in order to grow? And, uh, you know, that's like the original Pieta. The, the whole piece is really about the sacrifice of the Madonna of her son to like save, save us. And I was kind of making this point at that, like we're sacrificing ourselves and what are we giving up in order to have the, 
the kind of growth of McDonald's or to have what we have kind of all the time in, in our kind of current society. So it was a little bit playful on that, that side. And that's why that logo of the shirt was really important that it was the original McDonald's logo. Gotcha. So um, jumping back into the questions for the show, just, just an idea, like you said, it was about 10, nine weeks. What was, what was, was there downtime there at all? Or was it all yes. go, go, go? Yeah, there was, there was a lot of, there was some downtime. Um, it was, uh, it was pretty much like, there wasn't a lot. So like when we would get there, you would have these um, days where like you basically, you would like film things in, in, in segments. So we would, we would like go into the, the studio and then meet the guest evaluator. And we would have all of that filmed and then you would have lunch. And then <laughs> you would eat this like turkey with potatoes and vegetables. Blah, and then you would go blow glass for five hours. And then we would like kind of all get together and hang out actually like afterwards, which was really cool. Then we would go sit and like, you know, have all of our anxieties together and like, what did we just do? Blah, blah, blah. And then the next day was all interviews. So they would just ask you, really all about the process you just went through what your piece was about and um then we would have cold working and then the critique so you had these like moments of downtime but like pretty much every day you only have a few hours of nothing and then throughout the entire like uh, mm -hmm. uh process we had two days off i think wow I love this we discovered this that there was this like this was the season three cast and this was the season two cast <laughs> And we all kind of sat in these same same place all the time. It's the only place I had a table big enough to fit us all. So um, that, that's shows you how close awesome. we all were. <laughs> that, that's great. That's that's so interesting to to get the grasp of that. And you guys had a camaraderie too, while having the competition go on. Um, and then I hope uh, that the diet, the food was good enough. Did you get to request what you got to eat, or was this kind of what it is? <laughs> well, the the food that we got during the the, the uh, we, we could request stuff, but like what we got during the um during the challenges, it was like nice. Like on any other situation, it would have been great. It was just that we had to blow glass in a little while. So it was hard to eat this like kind of heavy food. It was <laughs> tasty. But the food in Hamilton was amazing. Like we, we spent a lot of time out eating. Pretty much that's what we did. We like blew glass, stressed, and ate. Yep. So oh, it was yeah. a lot of fun. So what do you yeah. think your biggest challenge was on the show? Hmm. I would say that with this image here, personally, there was two that were – I. I I really struggled with. Uh, I mean, maybe not struggled with is the right word, but it was maybe hard for me to, to put out. And the first piece uh, that I did, which was like about the death of my father, was one of the strangest or the strangest things for me to do because it's something I usually don't talk about that much. And uh, it was like putting that out there for whatever the entire world to see was mm -hmm. quite, um, it was quite stressful. And it was also the the first moment of the like working in the hot shop so I was figuring everything out and I had this idea to go into it and really make like 50 I think there's 50 components to that piece because there's these little leaves these little like the the, the petals of the flowers there's 38 of them there's these components of like drop water drops and dripping around and then this candle stick and this basketball and it was really a lot of parts to make sure I got done and you don't really have like a, a clock in the hot shop mm. so you're doing all of this and guessing your time and it was hard to kind of feel out that time immediately. So that was probably the most stressful one going into it. But once I got through that, um, I started to feel much more confident. And then later, I'll, I'll go through these images a little bit, but later there was a piece about a bird. And I think mentally, like the, the, the biggest fear, that was one of the hardest ones, not only for me, but for the entire group of us. We all got really like, we kept talking about it and it got really dark for us, actually. We were, I think they were expecting us to say like, what's your biggest fear? You know, spiders. <laughs> you know? Right. We, we went into this fear of like our, our this, you know, self-conscious, our own anxieties, our own <laughs> about like failure. So it was quite intense. <laughs> what's your biggest fear? Ah, oh, spiders. I'll make a spider. How about you? Ah, oh, tarantulas, man. Chickens. What? All right. That's pretty yeah, funny, and then man. We, we went into this, you know, these feelings of like, yeah, not succeeding and failing as an artist and what that would mean for us and in, in our own mentality. And all of us really went pretty deep and dark. So, yeah, I was, I was, you were commenting when we talked earlier about like the placation of uh, dialogue, which was kind of expected for you to say. And I always, <laughs> I always thought it really corny when people were in the show saying two hours left, five yeah. minutes left. 
Like, if your yeah. turn to say something, Bill, all right, my turn. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and a lot of that comes from it. Like I said, there's no clock. So you're asking, like, how much, what's the time check? What's the time check? And then they would ask you at points to just yell it out. So mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of like, they would yell it out for us a lot of times, but because we didn't really have, like, a, uh, like, every person needed to have their own timing, we would ask a lot individually what was the time check. So that's why they would, you know, they would have us yell out. <laughs> a lot of it's filmed still, you know. They put it in the, the right spots at the, the right time, you know. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the same vein, um, just in the same topic, the question I had for you was, before you went on the show, did you have an understanding, maybe by talking to Elliot or anybody you knew, what it was like to actually work and be on the show? like yeah actually i was i was pretty lucky about that like um i i know deborah well uh, i know i met elliot shortly before going on the show i knew alex a little bit so i i contacted all these people and just asked them about their experiences mm -hmm. and they gave me the rundown of like how much time you really have like what to look out for what to what to expect what to um yeah, like the time checks was something I wouldn't have thought about, but I knew that going into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. That made it a little bit easier. Also, they told us where the good food spots were and where we should <laughs> hang out. So we had all of the, had the nice information, I think, going into that, which was, it, it made me feel really comfortable going into it, knowing that I kind of knew what to expect. Um, I didn't exactly, but I had like an, uh, maybe an overall understanding in my head about what I would be, what I'd be facing. Yeah, that's probably important jumping into a situation like that. And I'm sure you probably help those around you with your experience too or coming to the show because, you know, having that knowledge is key, especially the, the timing and actually the, the places to what to do and make your time there the best. Where, where is this thing filmed anyway? Is it Canada or something I heard or where? Yeah, so it's filmed in, in, uh, in near Toronto at a place called Hamilton. It's about like an hour or 45 minutes from, from uh, Toronto. But like Umbrella Academy is filmed there and there's a bunch of shows that are filmed there. So it's this kind of industrial town that had surprisingly good food. And uh, it was really cool. And yeah, that was like what you just clued into, like that we all really, I know it's a competition you're going to the show, but there was never really a point where I felt like we were competing with each other. We were comparing notes on colors. We were comparing notes on the equipment, like where something wasn't working right, um, really supporting each other. Also, I mean, when we would go and have beers and dinner and stuff, we'd talk about our concepts and our ideas mm -hmm. and almost have like, yeah, like bounce ideas off of each other. And I think that was really, um, really nice. Like I, that for me was a reflection of what the glass world is like. I never felt like, oh, I'm here to beat these people or these people are here to beat me. It was just an absolute like, like a uh brotherhood you know I guess, yeah. yeah brotherhood they really yeah. they really played it on like you were super competitive at the beginning yeah. you know <laughs> you have some great great lines on the show uh, i'm going to brag i don't mean to boast but i'm here to win or something that, yeah. that is classic that is that's classic you know i think a lot of that they catch you in this like i i tend to ramble on in these situations sometimes so they're like can you make it concise in one word and then you're like uh. so a lot of that they really got me to like take everything i say and put it in one sentence <laughs> well at least you didn't quote like mortal Kombat. that would have been, that would have been a little <laughs> bit too much which is too fun yeah. so it's great to see like like we talked about you staying so true to your work on the show um what would you change about your experience in the show if you were to do it over again Oh, I, you know, I, I can say it, it would be really hard for me to say that there was something for to change. Honestly, going into it, like, I didn't know what to expect. And, um, like, all the people were great. I got along with everybody. Like, the only thing I wish we had was more time together. Like, one of the hardest things was the fact that, like, every episode or every challenge, somebody goes home. And then you you kind of regret this thing that you didn't have to more time with those people. And I think that would be, if, if there was a way to change that. Um, that would be one of the things, but the, the kind of nice thing about it is that we all became so close. So we're all in touch now and we start to start to see each other. We all saw each other at guests or a lot of us did and right. are keeping in touch for the future. So that's really cool about it. That's great. So, um, let's talk about the risks you took on the show because you were so staying so true to the veins of your, of your work naturally, like, like as you approach to each challenge, and you have a certain amount of time to come up with an idea, like, how did that work for you? Well, like, the, I think I, I was, when I was alluding to the first two, the first challenge with the piece, I made a lot of components. And then um, the drinking glass challenge, I struggled with that a little bit just because it's not something that I'm like, 
confident doing without, like I needed, wanted more time to develop that. But by the time I hit into the like third challenge where I started feeling myself in the sculpting um, range, I started doing assemblies hot and it wasn't because I was trying to do it to win. It was just like, this is what came naturally to me. And I think that was the, the thing. Once, once, you, once you're able to feel comfortable there, everything kind of started to flow together. It did for me at least. And I, I felt like the only things that I was like able to do was to stay true. Like I, I wasn't going to go outside of my, I, I, cause it's almost like my comfort zone or stick outside of my work and try to be somebody I'm not. It didn't make sense to me. So a lot of the way that we, we attacked problems or like, you know, these challenges are like a problem you have to solve. Mm -hmm. um, I would try to find like a, an avenue where it would work in the vein of the work that I make. Like this piece specifically with John and I did this, like it was, um, we had the idea to make one piece together. It's like, okay, it's a collaboration. We don't want to make a bunch of components. Um, <laughs> we knew we could like pull it off or we thought we could pull it off and we felt like we had a really good solid concept. And then when we saw that Robin and Julie or were the judges, it was great to- uh, Yeah, that was a slam dunk. Nobody <laughs> <there. laughs> yeah. better. Yeah, it was perfect. So we knew it was like, all right, we did, we got this or we felt really good about it. And it was weird because yeah, the, the piece is very- small and you when you when you see it when working on it it's huge but when you put it there it was small so we we really like you know we asked about putting the pedestal down so it really bring it lower and take up a lot of the gallery space without it being a lot of the space so we use the space and the pedestal as part of the piece mm -hmm. and i don't think that anybody was expecting some of those things that we did so that was that was I cool th i think the most incredible part of that whole episode was other john saying okay <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're yeah. like, I have this crazy idea. He's like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, it was funny when John and I were really talking. We had a dialogue about it. We went through a really lot of ideas. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, that part, they you have time to, like, talk about it beforehand, but then they film it. And they're like, okay, recap everything you talked about for two hours, <laughs> three seconds. So it was, it was a fun thing to go through that. And uh, we were trying to find a way to, like, make it both of our works so it wasn't, like, it wasn't heavily conceptual on my end or heavily conceptual on John's end or visually either. And luckily we, we, we melded well together because we both make like similar, uh, we both make kind of similar conceptual work, maybe not exactly the same and aesthetically, but in, in concept. So that's cool. Yeah. Make very literal things and yeah. You know, something you can recognize. Mm -hmm. That's pretty fun. Yeah. I, I, I saw that uh, Julian Robin Rogers were, judges and they displayed some of their work so we have a couple pieces up in the gallery celebrating their appearance on the show it was great to see them as well they deserve it they're hard workers so <laughs> yeah for sure do you want to talk about some of the other works that are in your slideshow before i dominate all the questions uh sure yeah so one of the you, you asked about this earlier this this piece with the bird this was one of the um one of the things that i found to be quite difficult at the time because not only like when I thought about it, like, what was this piece about? It's like, oh, the, the, the fear of failure, which is, like, pretty broad concept. But I think they they edited some – they took some of this this context out of it for me because it started to go – yeah, we started talking about it in, internally and then talking about interviews. And it started – we started – I basically started talking and thinking about the people that I knew who had been, like, giving so much their entire career. And then you think they were really successful, and in the end they ended up – commit suicide and this was such a fear that i think i i got into my head during this thing that like you you can invest so much in your in yourself as an artist and invest so much and still never really feel like you're succeeding so this piece ended up becoming this really kind of uh, idea about that and conceptually it was heavy and then like technically it was a it was a really long piece to make for a really small outcome and i wasn't sure if that was the right route but i was like as I said, it was, I had to, to make it, it had to be true to what I wanted it to be. It had to be, to fit this vision. I think this delicate kind of little bird was really the, the right way to portray that idea for me personally. Right. I remember, I remember seeing you complaining or commenting on how long it took you to make that bird. And you're like, all right, I just nest now. I think, I think I got to make it out of something around here. Let's go. Let's, let's go. You guys, you guys help me. And like yeah. with, with that kind of concept, like when you had assistance, Mm -hmm. right how were how were they was it was it an, an, an asset or a necessity no so that, that project that that piece in particular i'll go back to it was um yeah. really nice because we this one we had two assistants for it because it was the last challenge that it was like before the finale 
And um, uh, we had, so I had one assistant pretty much pulling stringers, like color stringers, so I could draw the pieces on and then making all the pieces for the nest. So like all of the red, the red stringers, they were just pulling that all the time until we were there to put assembly on. Because I spent hours drawing these little feathers on and the colors in because it's supposed to have a little bit of a reference to Van Gogh. That's the color pal palette that's in the, the bird. And that was one of the things I was trying to bring to this, um, to that idea of like, yeah, an artist that puts so much of his life into it and you think successful now, hundreds of years later, but knowing his real life and what happened, it's, um, it, it made sense to kind of bring that like, like um, style of, of color and application to the little bird. And um, yeah, so it was, it was great to have two people because yeah. I never would have finished that nest without it. <laughs> right. So like from an outsider point of view, and glass blowing is an important part of going back and forth and back and forth to the glory hall to keep the piece, you know, warm to work on. In a period of three hours, like how many times would you have put this thing back in to reheat it up, would you say, just to get an idea? On this piece, probably uh, hundreds. I mean, because I was working, I was keeping it really on the, the colder side. Mm -hmm. So like every, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, we're taking a short flash. Um, and as we're building, like when we started to attach it, we'd have to build up the heat in it again to let the, like to be able to stick the parts together. So you're really, it, it's even hard to count, but every maybe minute, at the very least, every minute we're taking a short flash, like a, yeah, yeah a heat to reheat. It, that's because it's so like how laborious this process is. If you were making this out of paint or clay, <laughs> you know, it's just like the pure, the pure effort it goes in to make something uh, just like this. So it has something that has the beauty of life, whether you like it or not. It's and then tr tr trying to keep the, um, the the piece alive at the same time and then not knowing how much time you have, it was like, oh, it was a, but it, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's frantic. It's why you keep running back to the glory hole to keep it going. Yeah. Um, let's see. Why don't you flip to the next slide and see what's, what's kicking. Oh, yeah, number two. It's great to see that uh, she was there with you. She really spilled her, spilled her story on the show. You know, I, I didn't have any idea about it, but I, after talking – to uh, you and talking to people that know her, I met her roommate um, about the story that that she experienced uh, live and a few months before, a few like a few months before she came on the show, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, like I didn't know Minhee going into the into the show at all, but I'm I'm really like I got to know her while we were there, and the shoot for me was very inspirational. I thought she was incredible doing everything she was doing and putting her putting herself out there like that, as well as like being there. I mean, I, I can't imagine having that um that like you're being in that period of grief and then doing amazing things and uh like we became like yeah it's funny so us here we're competing but this was the really uh, <laughs> like we became really close and and had a a great time working side by side we talked about even into our final pieces we were going to to like the, the coffee shop and talking about ideas and and trying to run each other through it so if it made sense and I, I yeah I think she was incredible. Uh, she is incredible, and I'm, I was really excited to have like made it to the final two with her. Of, of all of the people there, we I think we really yeah I think we really make very different work, but in the same vein. So it was really great to 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 be there together. Yeah, the uh, the overall concept I've noticed is that literal work really helps on the show because they give you literal context, mm -hmm. and if that's probably the big pull to for you, especially to be there, is you make things people can visually understand before mentally understanding and um yeah it might have hurt some other people on the show who who couldn't work in that kind of manner and then obviously make something in four hours or yeah. five hours which is which is insane it's in itself but oh there's the corning team it's great to see them helping you out this is the last day is the people you had yeah so this is event? yeah yeah that was the I'm sorry i didn't mean to skip forward but it's the uh i'm just trying to show this like whole series of like the camaraderie we had there the working together and and the way that we were able to 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 pull everything together um, the whole time. I mean, it's it's an incredible. I know there's been some criticism of the show by glass people and by people, but I know it's a reality show. That's all apparent. But the experience that I had there was was not that at all. It was like it was like I said, a full reflection of the glass community, like how much we support each other and pull each other up. And that was yeah, it, it would be great to see the that show. You know, yeah, there, would, yeah. there wouldn't be as much drama. <laughs> you know, it's the TV loves, but it would have been. 
I, think, yeah. I, thought, I thought for this season, like if you were to watch the first season and see it to the second season, the third season, they start to really show, I think, much more. I think they've taken some of the criticism and show more concepts, show more uh, techniques, show more um, of the community side of it. Like they really focused on that a lot more because it was important for all of us. And I think we were all really, uh, like all of all of the people who were there this time were all part of that community and, and really vocal about it. So it's easy to kind of make it come to life in the show too. Yeah, that's for sure. When, when Minhi was pulling the cane and it was falling apart, at the last, last, last competition, last project, and you're making a comment about how you want her to succeed no matter what. Uh, it was an important part of your message of how the comedy com worked, that's the word. But yeah, I and mean, it's it's like I didn't want to, you know, it was the thing like, like I said, Minnie and I were close. She's an, she is an awesome artist. It was like, you don't want to see somebody not do their best. Mm -hmm. Like, you never want to. You never want somebody to go home or something because they're they they just didn't have a good day. You want them to go home at, at a high note, and uh, and I and and especially because we were in the finale, you wanted to, I wanted to see her succeed. I don't want to win because somebody something doesn't work for somebody. That's crap. Mm -hmm. I wanted her to make the best thing she could make because that's the the reason we're all there, you know. And uh, yeah, she did. She made she did. it awesome, you know. Yep, she took she took advantage of the space, yeah. like you. He sprinkled it on the floor. Uh, <laughs> made, made some tiny little things. <laughs> but, uh, tell us about this photo. This looks familiar. Yeah, so that's the, this is what I, this is the streets of Hamilton. Uh, funny thing, like walking around and it was one of the things I think all of us did was take, take inspiration from everywhere. So this was one of the, this was the thing that I took a photo of and it made its way into my final piece, which was really kind of cool for me now to like find this photo again and be like, oh yeah, it's like almost exactly the same. <laughs> yeah so that's the question i had for you about taking the risk for that finale piece mm -hmm. what was your what was your thought process because i know the idea kind of hits you and that's how it goes i like i didn't feel like it was a risk because it was you know when you're talking about making an installation it's like you want to experience the space and every time i was walking into that white room it was this white room and it's kind of artificial in a way like it's art, you know glass floor mm -hmm bright white walls and it was like man if i can you know like take this space and do something really different from then every other person who's kind of done the show like that was one of the like one of the things everybody did was fill the space and i really wanted to use the space uh the empty space because it's part of it made sense for the concept and like i said i saw that rabbit and it was just this thing stuck in the corner and i knew i couldn't just do something like that i had to kind of <laughs> uh, one, one that would have been, been like, high risk. Just one rabbit over there. All right, I'm out of here. See you guys. <laughs> well, my initial idea was like uh, I think Catherine touches on it was really using just a couple of blades of grass and the rest would be gone. <laughs> I couldn't. I knew I couldn't leave it there. Also, in my own mind, I I am a bit of a maximalist, like they said in the in the in the critique. But I think when I was when I, I the producers were a little bit anxious about it. Like they were like, "Wait, you're going to do what? The small piece in the gallery and." Uh, is it going to have an impact on camera and is it going to look right and is it going to do the experience and i was confident in it because i was like yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a contrast for minis but that's okay but it's going to be this white thing with just this pops of color coming out and um i think even like when i was working so the, the team that i had was helen tegler eric meek and uh and tom tom whose name i'm i have a brain fart on right now tom Ryder, and they were incredible um and i think when i first started explaining my idea uh they were like yeah, okay you know because there's gonna be some broken plates on the floor and some stuff and once we started to like pull the pieces together and see the components together they could see it visually because as you saw on the, the show my drawings were really shitty just like scratching <laughs> and, and uh and and then also the way that they pulled to like see every detail um that like there's no way I could have pulled this off by myself mm -hmm. because there was these little details that really had to be perfect and they really focused on those to make sure that everything fit right and it looked natural going uh, on the ground. It didn't just look like a pile of broken glass. It looked like it was coming through the floor. And I, that was incredible uh, for me. Hey, and you really mentioned how, how hard it was or how did how do you make sure that the, the tile matched the color of the glass? Yeah, so we did a lot of trial runs even on that uh, to like – Initially, we were doing an overlay and then like making the plates and breaking them. And then we realized that was going to take too long. So we did one that wasn't an overlay, uh, like just pop, pop color on the pipe, gather over it. And then as we realized that actually the way that the light 
took it. It looked way better than the overlay color. So we ended up going that route and that made the plates really match the floor perfectly. And um, yeah, it was, it was weird because it's, it seemed like we took this whole day of work and smashed everything up kind of haphazardly because there's no way to really plan how everything would fit together. We were really guessing as we were going and building the building the whole time. So it was really like, it was really, it was really a great experience in that sense. Did and, you, uh, were you in charge of like titling every piece you made? Was there like, yes. Yeah. So what was this one called? This piece was called Beside the Golden Door. And uh, it was one of the, like, you have this, the, the whole, there was a lot of things that, that uh, I think it was a little bit, the whole piece is about this idea of like breaking through um, like our sense of reality and like trying to understand our places in the world. And a lot of the work that I've been making recently is about that, this kind of uh, confusion between like our understanding of the world as it is, but then like also other people's understanding of the world. So like where we have like our own experiences and then trying to understand those from other people's perspectives. And uh, I was using like a lot of like fairy tale or like mythical imagery to kind of make those things kind of cross between this idea of fantasy and this idea of reality. And this whole piece was about that, this kind of fantasy room that is the white gallery that's also kind of uh, not really, you know, nothing that like for me, I, I don't like having my work in a white space like that. Um, right. But this, this piece becoming this like, yeah, this, this entity in there was supposed to be this thing on the other side, this thing that breaks through. And um, there was a, 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 a quote or something called behind the golden door, which was about this, like the transition between um, like from life to death. So when you go beyond the golden door, and my kind of thing was to change that to the side. So you're kind of looking at it from the outside and trying to understand it from both, both places. So that was really the like, the full meat of the piece was that everything that's like, everything that's broken from things that are broken or from things that are, that are tossed aside, like life can come from it. That you, you can't conquer life, I guess. Which was yeah. a polar opposite from my piece before. <laughs> right. What, what, I, what I also see in this work is like, you kind of punishing them for putting you in a white room. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to put me in a, in a white, stale room. I'm going to take advantage of that and make it look like it's not supposed to look. And that's yeah, what yeah. made me so proud to see what you actually came up with for the show. And it also makes me feel, tickles me pink to make the producers nervous. And you have to say, just trust me, just trust me. Trust <laughs> yeah, me. Just yeah trust I think me. they were just really worried it wasn't going to come out the way that <laughs> I was envisioning it. And then it, it did, you know, and I had that uh, for a few pieces. I mean, there was a little bit of concern about the Trump piece too, if we were the elephant piece. Mm. Um, because we really were conscious never to use names and I was like a <laughs> caricature of a, and I think uh, I was also concerned about that one in the long run, but like, uh, yeah, I think there was, they were, they were careful to make sure that we were portrayed right. And they didn't want, what they didn't want was for, to go through this entire show and then come out that there's like a want, want, want at the end mm -hmm. of the, the experience. So I, I, I do appreciate their concern, but I, I was very confident it was going to work. So it, it came out just as I saw it. <laughs> That's the great news, my friend. I'm super happy for you. I'm glad that you were able to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish in your own way. And a, a shout out to Tom Ryder too. He was part of our Silver Show uh, a couple of years ago. So I'm glad that you, people in the community who are in the background are still supporting uh, people like yourselves in a public manner. It's, it's great. Yeah, he, so. he made all of my stones and all of my gravel and all the stuff. And Eric made all of the plates and Helen helped me on every other sculpted piece. We were just like raging together, like making everything. <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah. I don't envy you having to tell them what you're doing. All right, this is what we're doing. All right, you. <laughs> Plates, you. It's kind of a Virgin Mary. There's kind of bricks. It's kind of broken through. It looks like water, but yeah, it was like that. I think. Uh... I got it. I got it. You know, that's the trick. It's a good old management skills. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, we had you in our Not Grandma's Glass show, give a whole presentation of work that I think we'll expand on here a little bit. And uh, this piece is in the gallery and it, I just had a chance to see it in person yesterday. It's incredibly, it's much bigger in real life than it is in the photographs when you actually see it. But tell us about this piece because you told me about it recently and it's quite powerful. Yeah, so actually this, and, and, and not only this piece, but the entire show uh, yeah. coming into this, into, into the Not Grandma's Glass, it, it it's pivots on the same idea that I was, I was, um, I was thinking about for that final piece, like this kind of cross between reality and and uh, and uh, like fantasy. And that that piece, this piece in particular, it's pray for the sinners, but pray P R E Y um, 
was really like, I took a lot of it from the, during the, the period of the pandemic. For a lot of us, it was like, oh, what a great time. We kind of have time to spend with our families or spend with our, you know, focusing on whatever we want to do. But there was this other side of it that I, I had read about, which was um, like people who were like locked, especially children who were like locked together with their abusers. So this piece was really a, 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 uh, a piece made to talk about that or thinking about that. The, um, that, yeah, this, uh, I, it, some of the pieces I had been making already was already about this kind of loss of innocence as well. And it was about that, that experience like this, how do you come out of that? Like, how will it be for people to come out of this weird situation and weird mindset that we were all in for, you know, two years to kind of get back to reality, knowing that you lived through that. So in the piece, it's supposed to be really conquering that, um, that, that situation, even though it was, it's not a perfect situation. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really focusing on that, that period that, that people were abused during that, that pandemic. It's a heavy piece, but it has a lot, lot of imagery in it and a lot of things about overcoming and, and, uh, that, yeah. that's a, it's a real stuffed animal too, right? He's holding on to. Yeah. So that one's actually like, we, uh, I found this one and it's altered. So there's, it's got its throat cut. So there's blood coming out of it and that's all hand sewn, uh, hand sewn to the, to the animals. So it's something we, I, I searched for for quite a long time to find the right things. I needed to be a, a certain lamb because the lamb is also a symbol of um, yeah. There was a symbol of symbolism of like the, the the of Jesus as like a sacrificial lamb, and I wanted to use that because uh, as part of the imagery. Um, I use a lot of this in, religious imagery in these pieces, so that was really important for me that this specific lamb was part of the, the piece, and then that it was bleeding in a certain way, but it had to look also like it's a stuffed animal. I have some more details of this piece. I'll just skip through them so you can see it, but see it in real life at Habitat because it's really important to see a lot of these things. Um, we have it up on a pedestal versus on the floor for our particular display. And, and not to be punished, we put, I put you in a dark room at the gallery yeah. because I knew that's the kind of atmosphere that this work needs to be experienced because the lights really make the work pop up then when the backgrounds disappear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think when I when I model the work, I always think about it in a in a dark space with like hard lighting. Like it's something that it, it's where you catch the the features. And this the, the I talk about the piece a little bit. The form of the 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 figure itself was based on Donatello's David. Uh, and if you know like the little bit of history about that, he's like very it's it's a young David. It's like a thirteen year old David. And Donatello had really sexualized him. And then there was this whole kind of mystery of whether he was seducing these young boys. He was uh, he was using the model, so it was really made sense for me to use that that image. Mm -hmm. um, and then this kind of flaccid sword was really important to, to have as an image, a part of it. And the uh, the snake, it's like conquering again, like his fears, even though you never know. Like, yeah, it's it's, it's a little bit like a it's supposed to look like a deflated birthday balloon. So it's this whole kind of layering of these these uh, images to kind of give this whole atmosphere of the piece with a sense of i guess really overcoming and getting yeah. through it you know everything that happened happened for a reason and, and made you i guess what didn't kill you makes you stronger kind of mentality yeah and it's it's, it's weird to think about in that sense because it's not something that i personally experienced but I, I know people have and it's something that like you wonder as a as a person how would you ever come out of that mm -hmm. definitely you can kick back too to the beginning of the show if you want, and uh, sure. kind of kind of give a, a, a one hundred and one on the experience that you set up. This was in yeah. in Ghent. This was in your studio or near your studio, right? Yeah. So actually, I built a little like uh, I had built a, a little a, a gallery in the studio because we had a we have a great space here where we have like a workspace and this front room that was pretty much raw space, but uh, I got some funding from from the government here, and I was able to do an exhibition with this and bring in a lot of people to work with me and pay them, which was part where the subsidy came from. Um, and then we built this gallery to, to be able to put the show together, uh, which has really, has been really cool. Like that, it was really made the idea come together for me. It made it all fit. Um, there's a lot of elements to it. And it was, I really wanted to create kind of this atmosphere of this space. that's kind of like a, a little bit like a, like a, a, a dark museum or like something like a museum that's like, Twisted out of uh, <coughs> sorry, my dog is sleeping and barking in the background. Um, <laughs> but then you would have this like space between pieces enough that you could see things, but they related to each other. 
Um, so there's a lot of like imagery that kind of, it uh, cycles through the pieces. So these kind of, like I, when I say fairy tale bricks and stuff, I'm really talking about like Disney fairy tale. Like they look like supposed to kind of recall like Cinderella's castle collapsing. So like there's these motifs that kind of fall through the show and it's about exposing this kind of like the, 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 the fantasy collapsing underneath. And it's interesting living here in, in Belgium because as you walk down the street, the blacktop separates and underneath is this hundreds of years old cobblestone. And it's this weird kind of exposure of the past. And I really like that that, that happens because it's like a, a discovery in a way. And I really think that, that breaking through this, like, this kind of like um, the kind of reality we live in and then seeing this, which for me, it's still even living here. It has this kind of romantic idea behind it. So these bricks are really supposed to kind of... Uh, illustrate that this this romance of like of of what you know what like what, what is versus are. what was kind of thing. yeah exactly and also what is now like what what it is to live in europe as an american what it is to experience europe in a different way what does europe i mean we have this kind of uh vision of europe as americans like ooh, europe and and you know when you're here when you live here <laughs> it's uh <laughs> It's ooh. just like every, everywhere is like that, you know, like you, you live somewhere and it's, it's got its realities too. And I think that was something that came really prevalent to me during the, during the pandemic. Gotcha. This is an amazing show. We did a whole presentation about this work that you can watch on the Not Grandma's Glass website. It's up on YouTube and it's probably on your website too yeah. at uh, um, backdoorart.com. So check that out so you can explore the work from this exhibition. He has these very interesting uh, framed pieces on the wall that he goes into depth about. It is it is an incredible. This is you can see why he won at um, NGG two thousand twenty one and will continue this year in twenty two, which is which is very exciting. So let's uh, continue on, John. Yeah. So I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say uh, we'll we'll give a virtual tour of the space and habitat once we're done. I love mm -hmm. this piece. Yeah, this is one of the this is one of the other pieces like I, that that you have in the gallery there that was in the show that I I I really in like it was a it's a it's one of my favorite pieces I think because it captures the surreal emotion in it um, and it's a different piece in a lot of ways because it's like I don't typically make these kind of disjointed figures uh, but this piece like the story behind it the kind of narrative behind it was really important for me that it was um, supposed to be it was uh, based on a young girl who's uh, whose brother was killed by the police. And when they talk to her about it, like her, her memory is this idea of this, this, just her brother being killed. And later, some years later, I, I read about her again and she kind of pulled through it and um, I pulled through it. It's just weird to say, but she had like really blossomed into a, like a, an activist, into a, somebody who's, yeah, very active against police violence, very, um, uh, what's I'm trying to say very yeah active and I was trying to capture that it's like place between emotion like is she is she giving you something or is she asking for something that there's just capturing that that moment and it's a little it's so different than some of the other pieces that I've done that it's not just it, there's not so much um narrative in it it's more about the emotion and more about that that like reflection and yeah, I'm, I'm happy that this piece is there and can be seen in person because I think it really captures that that moment uh there yeah, so this is, you'll see in the virtual tour. Um, mm -hmm. John, when you jump back, someone had a question about the uh, the panels on the wall. Can you talk a little bit about that in the, the body of work in the NGG show? Sure. So there's, in these panels, there are these eight windows that I worked together with my partner on, uh, like, layering with these, um, like, there's all these photos that I took in museums and things, and then we made this kind of hodgepodge of, uh, of, uh, imagery that kind of fit together and each one has its own concept and each one is is like so from photos from things we found on the internet from uh like yeah from all different things and uh they were supposed to really be like this playful like windows that if you were because you, you see stained glass everywhere here and uh and it, it kind of sets the mood for what's happening inside of the, the church and this idea was that these windows would become this kind of thing that sets the mood for this fantasy world. That it's like these things we recognize, a lot of these uh, images that we know from like, yeah, either art history or from religious imagery. 
and then really like combine them really heavily with Disney imagery and with like um, yeah contemporary like things contemporary pop culture or like even very like photoshopped intentionally photoshopped images that cover things uh, up. So like each one has a story. I don't have individual images of them, but each one has a like a fun story or kind of a joke story. The one that we're looking at right now that's kind of hard to see is it's called Adam and Steve, and it's really like. I made this specifically after this uh, this this cake maker decided to, like didn't want to serve a cake to a gay couple, and it was just like the irony of like you make cakes and you're gonna make a, take a stand against selling to the gay couple. <laughs> so we just made this like you know they're holding this cake, the case, the the, the flowers around it are all look like penises. It's just like a a silly little kind of reflection of that, and yeah, in the the cake there's also. Um, I think it's an image from the, the, the cake makers themselves. We found the cake. There's other like little references to it, uh, kind of pointing the, the, the finger playfully at them, but still being critical. That was kind of the point, but that it had to have this, this playful, almost cartoonish, but still, still real uh, image. I, I, yeah, concept. And they're quite beautiful. They light up quite well, but they have, they're, they're mostly like, a, they're a great double take. Like you're expecting to see something and you look and then you can't not, look again because there's so much it's so different from what your mind is ready to receive and then the conversation starts and yeah. i love the one there's one with the, uh, an ancient sea a scene and there's a mcdonald's logo in the background floating above they're 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 quite quite beautiful but yeah definitely check out the ngg presentation to see those there's individual photos too mm -hmm. of, of every single piece or in john's website and john has all those in ghent and we'll someday figure out how to get those here but right now they're hanging out with him Yes. Thank you, John. Is there another question or should... Keep going. Yep. Keep going. Right. So I'll go back to... I think the... Yes. So just some details of the... There was some more details of this piece. And then that's the... The gotcha. last one. So uh, let me uh, give the... Let's give me... The, let me give the tour of the space here, if that's all yeah. right with you, John. Let me stop you from sharing and I'll take Wait. over the screen real quick. <clears throat> and give a little bit of a visual. I don't think the sound's working, so it's okay, but I don't need it anyway. So we'll do a little bit of the uh, the show we have here at the gallery, and we'll just kind of talk over it, you and I. Um, mm -hmm. We'll kick through me blabbing at the screen, and uh, I'm going to kill the mute, mute, and we'll start taking a left here into the room. So here we go. So we're here at Habitat, and we just set the show up yesterday as the work just arrived, and we can see the large installation piece that uh, is called Times New Roman. Yeah. New Times Roman. New Times Roman. Yeah, a play off of Times New Roman. <laughs> a play off of Times New Roman, yeah, which you can see. I kind of took a video of it with my cell phone. Our lights are kind of strong in the gallery, so you get an idea of why. Uh, we have like probably three or four lights pointing at it, the detail mm -hmm. of the work. And my guys had a good time installing this piece. It came out of the box. It went on display. <laughs> <laughs> but you can really see the scale and the size of this uh, piece that John discussed earlier. It is incredible and it's right in the front room when you take a right in our first large space so we kind of pulled some work away from our international which is still on display to make room for john's show because we're so excited about his win and blown away and this is where you can see the mcdonald's brother's shirt i wanted to make sure you can see and then on the left we have another piece that uh john created what's the piece title it escapes me john right here this protect and serve on the left protect, of, and, serve. Uh, protect and serve yeah and this piece, yeah, no, this piece I made, um, it was really very shortly after the, the shooting of Fernando Castillo because there was like so many, yeah, so much happening at that time. And I remember being really touched by, I mean, just shocked, I guess, by that, that he was shot while his kid was in the car. He had a legal gun on him. And there's this whole, you know, discussion of whether, whether and like that, that it becomes a, like a gun argument, but this is somebody who had a legal, legal right to carry and still seemed threatening for no reason other than, being a person of color, so this piece really was was inspired by that um, that that specific shooting. Um, but it's something like it's kind of been an epidemic, I guess. That's been ongoing, unfortunately, and uh, for quite some time. You could see that uh, John also won an award during our international show, Award of Excellence. I think it was awarded by the DIA, they were, who were the Detroit Institute of Arts, who had joined us the year for. Uh, celebrating the show and choosing the best in show. And now you can see the piece that John was talking about, 
Once we dive further through the gallery, we'll see John's dedicated room. There are 11 works entirely on display. Each work has its own story, its own narrative of what and why. Um, they're very powerful stories, very moving. If you had a chance to join us for John's NGG presentation, <clears throat> you really got a grip and understanding of why he creates and uh, the stories of each individual work. This particular one is about drones and the, the catastrophes they create. This mm -hmm. is a great one about Cinderella, right, John? Yeah, a little play on Cinderella. It's really about that, that you know, there's this moment when they did this, his, Cinderella's sisters beat her and tear her dress up. And I remember that image from when I was a child, like it was such a nonchalant image on the TV. And it was, I really wanted to use that as part of that, that meaning for that piece. Yeah. And it means about, it's about why do, why does, why did she have to wait for Prince Charming? Yes. She could have just, she could have just figured it out and left and been happy. Here's our, here's our sleepy. I love this guy. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll be adding this guy to my collection, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah. And then um, <laughs> this is, um, um, escapes, the, the title escapes me. Uh, it's called A Worthy Opponent. A Worthy Opponent. Will you tell us a little about this one? Yeah, this piece is one of the, uh, it's actually one of the first pieces that's, um, that links to the Pray for the Sinners. And this one is entirely glass, so it's really all assembled hot and a big, big piece. And again, you see that, like, that flower, the, the lily, is like the funer funerary flower, a symbol of innocence. And then this headpiece is a lamb, so it's, again, the lamb headpiece that links back to the... Uh, Pray for the Sinners. This piece was originally modeled after the Lost Boys from Peter Pan. That was the idea that he would be displaying this, this uh, symbol of innocence in his front, but has his fingers crossed in the back. Mm. So you don't really know what, uh, what he's, yeah, what he's, what secret he's keeping. Gotcha. Great work. Thank you. And then we dive over to the big piece we talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can kind of see we have it displayed down on a pedestal, lights on it, sword in place, lots to explore with, with this incredible, powerful body of work. And you got to imagine that when people walk in a gallery like this and see this kind of work, it immediately, they immediately understand the form and now they're seeking explanation of what and why. And that's really important for what we're doing here at Habitat Detroit Fine Art is making people feel something with the work uh, besides just enjoying it virtually or visually. And this is a, uh, John has a long and powerful relationship with Disney World and Disneyland and Disney products and knows, known for making skulls. Yeah. <coughs> this is really more literal of the Mickeys. <laughs> All right, I had to tone down the color for you to see it right there on display. And another powerful piece. This one is about, um, I believe, uh, women in general and how they're treated around the world. Yeah, so it was made uh, shortly after the there was this like, kind of attack that happened in, on New Year's in Cologne on women. And when the politicians all of a sudden, they cared uh, because it was done by Muslim, young Muslim guys, they kept using this phrase, oh, well, we have to protect our women, our women, and immediately claimed ownership. So this piece was titled Our Lady, uh, like Our Lady, like the, the lady. And it's based on the Vestal Virgin or the Virgin sculptures. Uh, so it's a bit of a play from that. Tell us about this piece a little bit. I don't really know the story behind our friend in the well here. So Loathing and Fear, uh, there was interesting because somebody took a read of it on, on my, uh, my, my Instagram that it was about the prison system. But it was really about this kind of xenophobic guy. For me, when I made it, it was about the xenophobia that this guy would like, be so afraid of what was happening around the world outside of him. He's building this wall around himself and he finally just builds himself into the wall and he can just peer out enough to see what's happening. So um, it was around the time I, it was pretty much the same time that there was a, another wall being built to separate two countries. And uh, it was a little bit of a play on that wall that it separates, you know, separates people from fear. Mm. Yeah, the better explanation I would have made up. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. That's so interesting. And so uh, that's John's show. And then in also promoting during the Blown Away show are the works by Julian Robin Rogers. We have a few in the gallery put this beautiful piece out as well. I got to put the tags out still. We just pulled them out yesterday. Um, I think this piece is about solidarity. I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but there hidden inside is a little kayaker. If I can focus my camera, which is, you know, someone experiencing life on their own, inside their own head, which sometimes we need to do that. And a beautiful character of a rabbit, just showing the talent overall, those two judges from one of the episodes. And it was great to see them. 
What'd you say? The teamwork episode. The teamwork episode, right. The, the judging that didn't matter, that, that show. But it was good to have them there. <laughs> they all were on in the, in, the, in the presentation, which is great. Everybody got to stay, which is, helps the plot, which, yeah. is, which is great. So that's John Moran's exhibition here at Habitat. Come see it live in person, take photos, share it online, blah, 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 blah. It's very important that we, we share this kind of artwork with uh, the world and the community. So let me kick out. So this brings us to uh, the good news here. And I'm spelling the name wrong on these. I have more places to fix it. This is uh, John's new edition he's going to be releasing as of this second. It's called um, Spilt. So I spelled it wrong. Spilt. So pardon me as I threw this together with the information this morning. Uh, there's an edition of, uh, limited edition of 10 being made with a with opportunity for 10 more if, the, if, the, if it is in demand. They're priced at $3,500 each. And this is an opportunity to work with John for having to create a single piece directly for you. So John, tell us a little bit about Spilt. Yeah, Spilt is, uh, if you recognize, is the, the character from, from Beauty and the Beast, the, 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 the kid Chip. But um, really what I was, uh, what the piece is really in reference to is, this, is school shootings. It's about this, these, um, this thing that's been happening, I guess, for a long time in, in the schools, unfortunately. And uh, using this kind of image of this, child uh you know child teacup from this from the the beauty and the beast and then having him kind of as if he's been knocked over or yeah spilt um so it's it's a it's supposed to have this kind of playful nature to it but it's also like most of my work has this kind of layered like conceptual point to it uh each piece is hot sculpted each one's individual and then i do the enameling uh it's like cold enameling and uh on the the rest of it, and then add the gold leaf once it's out of the annealer. That's a lot of fun. Each each one comes with your own certificate yes. of count counterfeit. Oh, not counterfeits. You're talking about authenticity yes. that John will be signing, and he has created this beautiful packaging and presentation for those who want to order it. They are available now on the Habitat.com website forward slash limited. Or if you go to the hamburger, you can click on the limiteds and see them there. It is it is quite an impressive um, addition to be ordered. And become and join John and his his life. And uh, these are kind of personal, where John will be in touch with updates and get get the story going, so you know when your piece is going to be near. And hopefully, we'll continue our relationship with John and maybe do some more of these if uh, if he's interested. You know, it's the idea of, of making it worthwhile. But that is it. That is our presentation today. John gave us a great glimpse into his world of blown away and his work in general. And uh, a glimpse into his life. I'm sure there's so much more we're ready to learn. And if you stick around for another two more hours, we'll get to the rest of it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, if anything you want to add, John, this is be the time. I'm super honored to have you here and, and, and tell us a little bit about your career and your life and your experience on this show. And we wish you the best, obviously, and, and, and to more attention as time goes by as more and more people. The first season, I didn't watch till four months after it came out. So I suspect people are going to come around. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that grows over. It just, it kind of grows exponentially is what I'm saying. You know, I'm really excited uh, that we were able to do this. It's, it's great. It's like, for me, it's really exciting to, to still be working together after so many years. And I think, yeah, it's all, I've always loved working with the gallery. I mean, I know there's, you have lots of artists and I always feel like I was one of the important ones, even though I wasn't selling a lot of work. And that's really, really special to feel that way. And, um, and also like the, yeah, just doing this and being able to, to meet people. And I hope that in October, when I'm going to be in Detroit, I'll come over and we'll do something then as well. So if people are in, in October in Detroit, I'll be there for the gas board retreat and then come over, stop in the gallery and say hello. That's a great idea. We should definitely, we're definitely putting a plan together. You'll be around in um, October. First so week we'll, of October. We'll be doing an event at the gallery to celebrate. So those who want to come by and see and meet John, he'll be in town at that particular time. And it will be great to uh, celebrate you in live and in person and talk about the work. Maybe do an artist talk live in the gallery about each piece and ha answer questions. So if people are around and you're interested, come and visit us here either now or then. We'll keep the show up. And from there, we'll see where it expands to. We're probably going to get some more of John's works. He has he said, mentioned to me that he has a, received a ton of inspiration from the show. Mm -hmm. So he's back in the studio working. He's received a Hundreds of thousands of comments from people on social media and email. Yes. I don't know how it's a whole job managing that, which is pretty incredible. We've had a lot of feedback from people in the, the the talk today, complimenting you on a great what a great person you are, an artist you are, and keeping up the good work. So it's awesome. great to, great to have that a kind of concept, the support in our community. So 
it is a hell of a light. Well, thank you, John, again, for being here. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This is a, a once-in-a-lifetime thing. We get one of our own put up in the spotlight, and we're all rooting for you, John. Uh, we're on Team John Moran since day one, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So, yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing this, Aaron. Anytime, my friend. Well, enjoy your weekend. And uh, if anybody has any questions, let me know. John, just so you, someone asked what the size of the teacup was. I think it's uh, six by four by six was yes. what we have. So six it's inches. almost exactly a teacup. I mean, it's really modeled after a real life-size teacup. <laughs> right, it is. So I, I'll probably put uh, the link to the edition in the chat real quick if I can figure out how to do that so people can go right to it, um, mm -hmm. which will be kind of fun to people to see it and get other questions answered and that's the place where you can order it so check on in the chat i just put the link to the teacup there you can see images of it and the story about it about john and we're going to be adding some more content to it about what he said about the school shootings that's the ins inspiration behind behind it and the story of, of bell and beauty and the beast being being part of it and you can see the certificate that you'd be receiving with the piece which is really adding to the whole presentation so Again, thank you all for joining us today. I wish everybody a happy weekend and uh, come and see John's show because it is an incredible experience. It is super relative to today's world where people are creating work based on today's experiences. And uh, I'm hoping in the near future to put this exhibition into a physical museum and keep the momentum going. So if anybody do know anybody in the museum world that have an interest, please reach out to me, reach out to John because I'd love to make sure this, this narrative and this energy continues uh, uh, and keep the momentum moving forward. All right, John. Well, good seeing you, my friend. Be well, and yeah, we'll all talk really. soon. Yep, take care. Take care. Be well.